Good evening. I'm Marnie Hughes, and welcome to a special edition of News Nation. Tonight, we are bringing you an inside look at the sex abuse scandals that rocked the Catholic Church over decades and a system that continues to protect some of its worst abusers. Tonight, a rare look into a little known religious order, one that has played a role in the Catholic Church sex abuse crisis throughout the country. Over the next hour, you will hear reporting from Larry Potash, longtime anchor and investigative reporter with our Chicago station WGN. We start with a clergy sex abuse survivor sharing his story. My name is John Bellocchio, and I am a victim survivor of clerical sexual abuse. I just don't want this to happen again to another kid. I would like to see Ted McCarrick die in a prison jumpsuit, but he's not behind bars, and that's where he ought to be. You can't turn these people loose. It's not fair to society. Men are warehoused in a rural, heavily wooded area to keep them outside or at least beyond the law. This issue impacts everybody. They are the problem. They're a big part of it, but they can fix this. This sanctuary hidden in the woods is run by a religious order most people have never heard of, the Servants of the Paraclete. Founded in 1947, its mission is to help clergy in crisis. They are soon overwhelmed by priests accused of sexual abuse. Are clergy the best people to keep an eye on priests? Some suggest the Servants of the Paraclete aren't helping these priests, they're hiding them. Okay. You guys got to do me a favor. Yep. Yeah. You got to disconnect me for a minute. Okay. Because yeah. my sugar is rapidly dropping. Okay. Okay. Is it all right? Yeah, want, why don't you sit here? Yeah, we're doing great. No, I'm good. It's just like, I just want to take a sip. Is that all right? So I think it's very fair to say I was a much more outgoing, um, trusting kid. The outlook, the positivity changed significantly after the incident. Yeah. The damage that this does is, is chronic. You have to recognize the fact that it will live next to you for the rest of your life. And we witnessed you experiencing it this afternoon. You did. In what way? Um, I sat with you uh, in a hotel room that I think was smaller than we both thought it would be. Um, and it was kind of eerily like a confessional. It kind of had the exact same look going on and you got to see firsthand the unbelievable speed with which that can kind of take you over. It's unimaginable how deep and wide this goes. Anytime I do talk to somebody about what I do, Everyone has a story of someone they knew or a family member and the profound impact that's had on everyone around them. I was raised in Hackensack, New Jersey in an Italian-American enclave that was very loving, very accepting, uh, very helpful and that the church was a central aspect physically as well as spiritually of the neighborhood. School year 95, 96 would have been my eighth grade year at St. Francis School. McCarrick uh, was scheduled to visit the church and his duties as Archbishop of Newark. And I had been asked by the pastor to be 
an altar server. At the time, of course, I thought, you know, I thought it was a significant honor. Can you discuss the case of former Colonel McCarrick? Wow, Theodore McCarrick. You dare take this oath again? This is a guy who may have completely changed the framework of things. Theodore McCarrick is one of the most powerful people in the U.S. Church with a direct line to the Vatican. He has money, he has houses, he has access to anything that he wants. On the day he was uh, scheduled to come, we were scheduled for another three to four feet of snow, and Mass was not very crowded. At that point, uh, he directed that uh, he wanted to hear my, uh, hear my confession. What's going through your head during this? I would say it's fair to say that almost uh, uh, kind of uh, a separation of, of, of my, like you know it's happening, but this can't be happening. At some point, though, did you tell your parents what happened? No. Nope. No. My fear was if I didn't come forward, uh, people would not know that Theodore McCarrick was so intrinsically evil. Uh, and, and I do believe that he is intrinsically evil. McCarrick is one of the apex predators of the church. And that's why the Theodore McCarrick story is so powerful. Instead of facing the evil, the church authorities took the lower road. They took the, the lowest road possible, and they allowed the perpetrator to rise. So I think it's fair to say that he was one of the most powerful Catholics in the world, not just the United States. He spent his entire life ingratiating himself uh, into rich and powerful and political circles. It made him invincible, and he thought he was invincible. Shame on you! How many wives? How many children? Gotta hell the carrot! That's where you're headed! Mr. McCarrick, how can you plead not guilty when the, when the church has shown you to be guilty? Even in your 90s, you cannot hide. Mr. McCarrick, do you want to say anything in defense of Please. You've been doing this a while. Had you ever heard of the servants of the paraclete? I had not. After having done this for as long as I had, I had not heard of them. Most people have no idea that this is where the worst priests in the country are being sent to live. It is a place outside of St. Louis in a rural, heavily wooded area. It's very easy to pass and to overlook. I think that is by intention. If you believe in the golden rule, if you believe that anything that Jesus had to say, I think you have an obligation to tell the public. Many people had no idea a place like this mm -hmm. could exist. I'm curious, how you became involved in this investigation in the first place. What sparked the interest? I got a call from an alleged victim of pre-sexual abuse who saw me in a documentary uh, about the John Wayne Gacy case that had something to do with sex trafficking, some stories that I had done. And so I think he felt that I would be a good person to maybe look into this. And 
in the, in the conversation, he brought up this compound in the middle of the woods, and I went, wait a minute, what? And I, am I the only one who is not familiar with this? Mm -hmm. And I started asking around. I, I, I hadn't met anyone who had heard of this compound in the woods that houses the worst uh, sexual uh, abusive priests or accused sexually abusive priests in America. And so I, I thought people need to know about this uh, because one of the biggest problems in this decades long story is the issue of transparency. Mm -hmm. And you found secrecy. This place is shrouded in secrecy. How difficult was it as you started to peel back the layers and get answers to uncover what was really happening here? Well, I'm still not sure I know what's going on inside there. Uh, we talked to a lawmaker who's been trying to pass legislation to say, hey, let's regulate this place. Let's find out what they are doing. I mean, this is not too far from a school. I doubt many of the people in that community know it's even there. Uh, what kind of oversight is there? There doesn't seem to be a lot, but we don't really know for sure because it's the church watching the church in a sense. Mm -hmm. And the critics in this story say, let's have an outsider take some control of this so we know what's going on. Right, and the church doesn't respond. Church doesn't respond, the Vatican doesn't respond, this order doesn't respond. And one of the alleged victims that we talked to said, if this is such a great idea, why isn't the church getting out in front of everyone and saying, look what we're doing. This is a great idea. Nobody says that. Nobody says anything. Yeah, but you talk to victims and their abuse dates back decades. It is physically hard for them to share their stories. How difficult was it for you to convince them to speak out on this? Well, the victims that I spoke with have been active, they're, they're activists. Most do not, most don't even come forward. So it's, it's, it's difficult to find victims willing to talk. And it just shows you that this problem of kids being abused by priests and religious clerics is way bigger than anybody realizes. Up next, a safe haven hidden in the woods. Inside, the religious order providing a secret sanctuary for clergy members in trouble and the new calls to bring their identities to light. I'm Marnie Hughes with a special edition of News Nation. When case after case of sexual abuse in the Catholic Church became public, accused priests and other members of the clergy were shunned by the community. But around the country, programs within the Catholic Church dedicated to renewal and healing opened up their doors called Servants of the Paraclete, almost like secret societies hiding some of the worst abusers from the rest of the world. Today, there is still one standing that we know about in a wooded area in Missouri. Again, here's Larry Potash. Why do they call you the fixer? There's a fixer in every diocese and in every religious order. All my assignments were following priests and religious who sexually abuse kids, and I was to clean up after them. Did you ever feel dirty doing that at any time? At some point you go, this is never going to end. So for me to be authentic, I got to go. What is your mission now in life? Basically listening to survivors and giving them a little modicum of hope. I didn't understand it was pervasive in every diocese and in every religious institute across the world. So there, there are kind of two ways to go, and I, I can do both. One is like dates, 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 and the other one is kind of just like origin story that they tell about them. I'm Kevin Lewis O'Neill. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto and director for the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies. 
So Father Gerald Fitzgerald founds the Servants of the Paraclete in 1947 because he recognizes at this time in, a, in the American church history, there is no support for priests. He is a hard-nosed Roman Catholic priest from Boston who had these incredible ideals that he wanted to pursue to minister to those who minister. And so the real vision of the organization is really to support priests being priests. So if you're looking at the time of Father Fitzgerald, you're going to see a period where he really believed in the spiritual exercises, that we're going to make that priest get back to his spirituality, that we're going to change his behavior by improving his prayer life. He has absolutely no faith or trust in therapists, in social workers, in psychiatrists. Fitzgerald is, is very clear that one could pray one's way out of these problems, whether it's a failing vocation, alcoholism or other kind of struggles in one's life. The first renewal center opens up in New Mexico. He's able to purchase 2,000 acres of land on which sits the ruins of a Franciscan monastery. So there's a bit of infrastructure. Within the first few years, priests begin to show up, not for alcoholism or lack of faith, but because of credible accusations against them in terms of uh, sexual abuse. Part of Fitzgerald's solution to the problem was to create distance between society and the priest who could not manage his sexuality. So for those who are irredeemable, completely incorrigible, let's put them on an island. The history of the island is a series of mishaps. It does not support priests. It does not become the vision of what he wanted it to be. It was a good idea, but it was a 19th century idea in a 20th century world. The official position is priests are celibate and holy and they're chaste. But if we have this island over here that we're specifically funding with the people's money in order to isolate these really severe sex offenders, that doesn't jive with the position. So that's why they made him sell it. Fitzgerald begins with the first renewal center in New Mexico and expands to a second in Santa Fe. And then demand begins to allow for the servants of Paraclete to open renewal centers throughout the United States. They were bringing people in from, from all over, right? He would put him through the six month program and then Father Fitzgerald would write a letter to other bishops and say, I have a priest that has a need to be able to find a new home. Are you willing to take him? And they did. And that's why it became a washing machine for some really bad people. By the mid-1990s, the servants of the Paraclete enter in a very intense period of litigation. The New Mexico facility closed because they'd been caught taking these dangerous men and letting them go out and do weddings and funerals and Sunday masses. The servants of the Paraclete don't have deep pockets to begin with, but they are named in a number of different lawsuits. They do provide clear evidence that bishops in the United States and the Vatican itself knew about clerical sexual abuse since the 1950s, and yet didn't make a public statement until the 1990s. That is a half century of silence. This is not a mistake. This is a very calculated method to, to the madness here. I wouldn't be surprised if many of the people in the community had no idea that they were there. At an absolute bare minimum, church officials should say, here are the priests who are staying here. least 
church officials can do is say, and here is where they are. Keep your kids away. Sometimes those priests are allowed to go disappear in communities where no one knows they're there. Brother Robert was a Irish Christian brother who had multiple assignments across the United States. Tragically, he's not alone. Other priests who were sent to the paracletes to allegedly be monitored and supervised forever leave the facility. The real question is, how in the world do they allow him to walk? That's what scares me. You went there. What was it like being there? I know it was challenging getting near the property, getting anyone to talk, but what was you, your sense when you arrived? It looks like a summer camp, maybe. Uh, it looked like 70s ranch houses in the middle of the woods next to a farm. You would never know it driving by. Uh, and even if you went down the one road to get there, you could probably drive by it if there wasn't a sign and not think anything of it. Mm -hmm. There are several homes in and around that area and the order has tried uh, to purchase the homes because apparently they see a need and we saw them going in and out of some of these homes. Uh, we were able to set up there because there was one neighbor who refused to sell to them mm. and he let us set up on his property. So that's how we were able to get the video and the access that we did because mm. this compound has many signs saying no trespassing and we respected that. Uh, but we were able to approach some of the, either the brothers from the order or some of these clerics mm. who are there being treated, whatever that means, going back and forth from one part of the compound to the next. If there are registered sex offenders, why have they not served any time? Have they served any time for their crimes? Um, usually not, because what happens when young people are abused, it often takes decades for them to come to the realization. And by that point, the statute of limitations criminally have long expired. Still ahead, a compound raising concerns for nearby communities, but even lawmakers can't seem to get answers. Welcome back to a special edition of News Nation. I'm Marnie Hughes in Chicago. For the victims of Catholic Church abuse, it's not just about getting justice. It's about making sure what happened to them doesn't happen to anyone else. And that is why this compound in Missouri has so many concerned. A group of accused abusers living together free of consequences while so many still suffer. Here again is Larry Potash. How did what happened to you impact your faith going forward? You know, that's a really tough question to answer. Um, and the short answer is, I just don't know. I was sexually abused over a period of about four years, roughly starting at age 11 or 12 by my parish priest. It's such a typical story. He ingratiated himself to our whole family and uh, would come over for dinner and that type of thing. And eventually I started volunteering at the church and to repay me for volunteering, he would take me on out of town trips. And it was always on those trips that he molested me. Um, it always when it was just the two of us and I was just terrorized. I had no idea what was going on or what, what to do. Years later, I ran into him in the St. Louis airport. And he looked at me and he looked pretty scared. He started walking faster and faster and I kept calling out his name louder and louder. And I had the presence of mind to realize that these TSA people might think I look a little unhinged. And so I just stopped and I just said, look, I was sexually abused as a kid by that guy right there. And I said, I haven't seen him in 25 years. And I said, and I'm just walking away, so no need to worry. A little old lady who I'd never met just you know, reached out and grabbed my arm and said, good for you.
Eventually then, when I was uh, around 30, uh, is when I had my first memory of the abuse. Shortly after that, I found out that he had also molested uh, three of my brothers. It absolutely just shattered our family. That was followed several years later with the disclosure that my brother had been uh, accused of molesting kids. It created an enormous rift in our family that uh, never has been healed and uh, I don't think ever will be. Had you ever heard of the servants of the paraclete? I hadn't until you all called me and then I looked and did a little research. What was stunning to me, I think first of all, was that there was such a place and that there was such a place that did not have clinicians present. My sense of Dittmer right now is that it is its own kind of island where men are warehoused either to endure or wait through their own processes of litigation or to keep them out of sight and out of mind. My concern is that there's nothing regulating this. I think this was something that, that flew under the radar for quite a bit of time. It's about keeping people safe. It's about keeping communities safe. If this is a treatment for sexually deviant behavior, then let's ensure that these people are getting treatment rather than just housing them. If there's no licensed therapist, if there's no physician, psychologist, psychiatrist, no one there to regulate this, then we have no idea what they're even doing. I'm oftentimes frustrated and irritated by what goes on, but you know, I'll just keep fighting it. I'll keep pushing it, I'll keep bringing it up. My name is Larry Potash. I'm with WGN-TV in Chicago, and we're in Dittmer today. We were wondering if there was someone we could talk to about the center. Hi, can we talk to you? Sir, can we talk to you for a second? Is there no supervisor here or that you wish not to speak with us? Okay, is there anybody else there? Oh, okay, thanks. I hope as we tell the story and people become aware of it that we're gonna help them change. We have a huge, huge responsibility. We can't change the past, but with the knowledge that we have now, we're accountable to do something different. We're getting phone calls every day from survivors. There's so much to be done still, and so that's motivating. If you channel the sense of outrage, the moral outrage that we should all have at something like this, you can channel it to change. I would say that that is the, sort of the conscious decision I made. I can certainly say, though, that I'm heartbroken. I just 
don't want this to happen again to another kid. Did these victims expect justice? Do they expect accountability? I think that's what motivates them. I, 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 I suspect their expectations are low at this point after all these years, but I think they continue their fight and raise their voice so that others may feel the courage to come forward after all these years, uh, people who may for whatever reason, feel the need to keep it a secret. Mm. What was the reaction? You showed a little bit of it on camera, but from the people who were there. They didn't want any part of us whatsoever. They did not want to speak to us. You could see them walking away, driving away. Mm. I called them a number of times. And it makes you think, after everything the church has gone through in the headlines, you'd think you'd have a different public relations approach to say, this is what we're doing and we're proud of it. And let me tell you what we're doing, but they don't do that. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what questions you're still asking that you don't have answers to. What, what's the what's next here? When you think of all the big problems in this country, all the congressional hearings we've had about steroids and baseball, <laughs> mm -hmm. and there's no congressional hearing about this ever, even now, <laughs> after all these years and after everything that's happened, we see in Missouri, they won't even vote on a bill to shed some light onto what this place is, is doing. Three times they've tried. Mm -hmm. Maybe this time yeah. we'll see something different. Up next, the Catholic Church has handed out apologies, but one watchdog organization says that doesn't go far enough. What they say true accountability looks like. I'm Marnie Hughes with News Nation and a special report. Sexual abuse by Catholic clergy members has been reported in every single state in America. More than 6,000 have been credibly accused, a number that is likely even larger due to cover ups from inside the church and also victims who have never come forward. Terry McKiernan is the founder of Bishop Accountability. Let's talk about the servants of the paraclete in Dittmer, Missouri. Uh, it's a place I had never heard of. Were you aware this place, this compound existed? Oh, certainly. Um, it's a very, very important uh, place in the Catholic Church and in the whole geography, geography of the abuse crisis. And um, it's been in operation for many years. Some have warehousing functions like the facility in Dittmer. Others are attempting to treat priests. This has all really changed in recent years because I think there's, there's more acknowledgement that uh, treating priests and returning them to ministry is a very bad idea. How does the church reconcile the treatment of priests that they have taken out of different dioceses from across the country, but also keep secret how they're treating them and then where they go after they've been there? I am personally and professionally not surprised that there are expressions of transparency and accountability that aren't consistent with the practice of church institutions. So, it, and this is a perfect example. If you want to know where priests who have not been laicized, who have not been released from the priesthood, but are accused of abuse, where they are, what they're doing, almost always you're going to encounter the problems that Larry encountered. So you could argue that Dittmer is, is a place where 
the priests are under lock and key, except we don't know that they are. And there's some indication, as you know, that they aren't. Are there more Dittmers that we don't know about across the country? When the Vatican decides not to laicize a priest who has, in their judgment, offended, they will allow a diocese to carry on with its policy of keeping the priest out of ministry and housing him someplace. But we almost always don't know where that place is. And um, that's, a, that's a problem. And that's a problem that transcends the whole Dittmer situation. I would estimate that we're probably looking at something like a thousand priests who are still priests, but are prevented from ministering, at least we hope so. Which begs the question of oversight. Why have there not been congressional hearings about this? There are congressional hearings about almost everything else. This seems that important. Yeah, I agree. And survivors have for many years been calling for something like this. I think it's our politics. I think it's a position of religion in the country, perhaps. You look at Washington and um, they can't get out of their own way. Is there much hope that they'll do something constructive and important in this regard? I'm not sure. It is brave and courageous, the victims who have come forward to share their stories. What does justice look like for them? What is accountability? So many survivors that I work with and talk with really want everything to come out. What they mean by that is all of the documents. Once you can look over the bishop's shoulder and in effect see him signing that letter that sent that priest off to another parish or another diocese, sometimes to do exactly the same thing. Once you can see that, the problems of this institution are vivid in a way that they weren't before. And change, I think, becomes more likely. So a library, a database, a place that compiles research and information, also numbers, there are extensive um, documents from all states of accused priests. What percentage of priests in the Catholic Church have been accused of some type of abuse? It's a really interesting question. And it used to be that people thought it was about 4% on the basis of a report that the church itself did back in 2004. Pope Benedict of happy memory once was quoted as saying that it's less than 1%. It's clearly climbing above 6%. And our best guess is that the correct number, at least for the United States, is probably about 10%. It's a pretty scary number, and I think it's important to remember that different priests do different things. So when we think of 10%, we're not saying that every single person in that 10% is doing some of the terrible things that we find in the Illinois Attorney General's report. But abuse is abuse, and it needs to be noted. Still ahead, many of these cases date back decades, but predators within the Catholic Church are still being exposed every year. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of News Nation. I'm Marnie Hughes. A bombshell report from the Illinois Attorney General just this spring found the state has corroborated more than 1,900 Catholic sex abuse claims against children. Some of those cases go back years. Other victims are still to this day finding their voice. And as a result of this series, have more victims come forward, even confidentially to you? I've received some messages of people who say that they have been abused in the past. Uh, we spoke with attorneys, uh, some who did not necessarily appear in the piece, who say they get calls every single week of people saying that they have been sexually abused uh, by priests. And that's just kind of how this works. It's people coming forward many years after the fact. So whatever you're seeing now, it reflects the past.